Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. The title of canonization refers to the Catholic process of being made a saint, but we need to remember that within the Protestant Elizabethan society, such a title would have been very provocative. So let's take a look at uh, the poem itself. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Or chide my palsy or my gout, my five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout. With wealth, your state, your mind with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place. Observe his honour or his grace, or the king's real or his stamped face. Contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me love. Alas, alas, who's injured by my love? What merchant's ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my colds the forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? Soldiers find wars, and lawyers find out still litigious men which quarrels move, though she and I do love. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Call her one, me another fly, we're tapers too, and at our own cost die. And we in us find the eagle and the dove, the phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. We two being one, are it. So, to one neutral thing both sexes fit. We die and rise the same, and prove mysterious by this love. We can die by it, if not live by love. And if unfit for tombs and hearse, our legend be, it will be fit for verse. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms. As well a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs. And by these hymns, all shall approve us canonised for love. And thus invoke us, you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage, you to whom love was peace that now is rage, who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of your eyes, so made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomise, countries, towns, courts, beg from above a pattern of your love. So, as we said, the concept of canonization would be provocative, given the Elizabethan period in which it was uh, written. Practicing Catholics were persecuted under Elizabeth, and Dunn's own brother died in the Tower of London as a result of his Catholicism. So this is um, a kind of persecution that Dunn would have been profoundly and acutely personally aware of. Um, also, in terms of Dunn's own biographical context, he didn't receive his degrees from Oxford or Cambridge because he refused to swear the Oath of Allegiance. Um, that was the Oath of Allegiance to uh, the King or Queen, which would have recognised them as the head of state and the head of the church, which would have compromised his Catholic faith. And the poem, finally, is likely to have been written in the wake of the criticism that he received for secretly marrying Anne Moore an act that ultimately led to his imprisonment, albeit briefly, and his exile from courtly circles. The opening, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love, is incredibly colloquial, with, which is a really sharp contrast to the poem's formal, spiritual uh, and religious title. So his use of a, a blasphemous curse, God's sake, undermines the expectations created by a title that seems to focus on a profound piety. Uh, the poetic voice's frustration and anger is implicit in that shocking opening clause. And the poetic voice is clearly frustrated, frustrated that the behaviour of the addressee is limiting his ability to love. Although it's interesting that the soft alliteration of le, as in let me love, uh, used when speaking of love, represents the contrast between the gentle emotion of love and the harshness of his anger because that love is being limited by others. Dunn states, or chide my palsy or my gout, my five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout, presenting himself as physically infirm or poor. He suggests that the addressee should criticise those aspects of himself rather than his love. Um, palsy is a form of shaking disease, so reinforcing this sense of physical disability, and that's complemented again by the reference to gout and inflammation of the joints. 
Again, the five grey hairs, a symbol of ageing and um, loss of vitality. Um, and the specific number of hairs renders it hyperbolic, the fact that he claims that there are five grey hairs. It's worth recognising that um, actually Dunn would have written, written this while still pretty young. So this is all hyperbolic. And finally, ruined fortune is interesting because it's not just that he's saying that um, he's poor, but that he's lost a fortune. Uh, we've got alliteration of those forceful fricatives here as well, maintaining the sense of the poetic voice's anger, that five, fortune, flout, some very aggressive, powerful sound. He moves on to alternative enterprises that perhaps the addressee could potentially devote their time to rather than focusing on his behaviour and his love. Um, the key word here is improve. Uh, the poetic voice suggests that the addressee's time would be better spent on a programme of, of self-improvement, really. Um, with wealth, your state, your mind with arts improve. Now, I may be pushing it a bit with this one. But I'd claim that the verb improve is zygmatically linked to the first clause. So rather than it just appearing at the end of that uh, first line here, it should also be at the end of the first clause of it. With wealth, your state improve, your mind with arts improve. Although, of course, it doesn't appear at the end of that first clause. So you've got this inversion of conventional word order and the omission of the verb until the end of that second clause, which creates a sense of delayed gratification that could mirror the gratification that the poetic voice claims the addressee might achieve by focusing on these different possibilities. It's maybe a bit of a stretch, but I like it. Uh, the poetic voice then suggests that the addressee could attempt to increase their own wealth, having previously suggested that they could mock his own loss of wealth or improve their mind for exposure to the arts such as poetry or music. Uh, he uses this series of imperatives to convey the poetic voice's sense of authority. You know, take you a course, get you a place, observe his honour. And they should find a job, get you a place, or observe others in high status positions in order to gain that kind of self-improvement that was suggested in the opening line of this sequence. His honour or his grace are likely to refer to judges or those in Positions of power within the church, um, because those are honorifics associated with those fields. Uh, grace referring to a bishop, your grace, and your honour, his honour, referring to a judge. But there's an irony in Dunn's choice of suggested occupations. We've got to remember that he trained as a lawyer at Lincoln's Inn and following his rejection from courtly society after his marriage to Anne Moore, he was only permitted to work within the church. We've also got this mocking tone that's created by the final suggestion of observing the king himself. Now, that might seem like a valuable instruction uh, because the king is obviously the highest authority, the person with the most power, who better to learn from, except the, there is this juxtaposed alternative or his stamped face. And that seems to be a reference to a coin stamped with the face of James I, implying that there's as much worth in the observation of either the coin or the king himself. The poetic voice basically just wishes the addressee to contemplate anything other than his love. Uh, the poetic voice isn't really interested in the self-improvement of the addressee. He just wants the addressee to turn their attention away from the criticism of him and his lover. So hence, the poetic voice is unconcerned about how the addressee uses their time. Um, and that's, that dismissive nature is evident in what you will, um, as long as they don't prevent his love from functioning. So structurally, Dunn adopts a form of epistrophe. The first and the last lines of each stanza end with the word love, reinforcing that love is the beginning and the end of uh, his concerns. The second stanza begins with the exclamatory alas, and it's repeated so that it becomes hyperbolic and uh, clearly displays Dunn's sardonic approach. He poses a series of rhetorical questions, each of which highlights how ridiculous it would be to regard his love as anything to be concerned about, anything potentially dangerous, 
And obviously, again, going back to the context, we can see why that might be significant for Dunn, given that he's been exiled from society as a result of his uh, marriage to Anne Moore. So Dunn undermines the conventional Petrarchan imagery of profound emotion having an effect upon the world. So, for example, what merchant ships have my size drowned? His size haven't drowned ships, nor have his tears caused floods, although these are the kind of claims uh, presented by those who adopt a kind of Petrarchan model of poetry. He's exploiting the same imagery here as he did in the final stanza of A Valediction of Weeping, if you wanted to make a comparison. He moves on to suggest something else that um, hasn't caused any kind of danger. His own colds haven't delayed the spring. When did my colds a forward spring remove? And similarly, the heat that flows through his veins hasn't added to the number of plague victims, the plaguey bill. Uh, we've got to remember again in terms of context that the plague had been a, a terrifying feature of life in London since the 14th century and was initially associated with the fevers that Dunn's referring to, those heats. It was also widely held belief that uh, hot temperatures increased the spread of the plague. So Dunn's presented this series of disasters, none of which could have been caused by his love, which is harmless and by implication should be treated as harmless. They should be left alone. And finally, extending the concept of the world being unaffected by his love, Dunn turns from those things that are not caused by their love to the things that continue despite their love. Soldiers find wars and lawyers find out still litigious men. So, so soldiers will fight, Lawyers will continue to deal with those kinds of people who are in dispute, the litigious men. So he's got a contrast that he's establishing between his peaceful love that's being criticised and the external world of hatred, which isn't. It seems bizarre. So the implication is that it's ironic that the addressee would seek to limit his ability to love when it's the quarrels of wider society that demand attention and foreshadow Dunn's later claim that their love should actually be held as an example. Okay, so I hope you're going to join me for the uh, second part. Okay, take care. Cheers. Bye.